Well, we remain with Leibniz for the second half of the morning, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Martha Bolton from Rutgers University, who's going to speak on Leibniz and monadic change. Martha. My thanks to Eric for inviting me and for organizing this conference. Um, and I also want to thank him for uh, placing me on the program after Don's excellent paper. Uh, Don is a tough act to follow, but he did lay out a lot of groundwork, uh, which is, will be very helpful, I think, in, in, uh, in uh, connection with the, the, what I'm going to be doing because I have not uh, taken the time to, uh, to spell all that out. I'm going to focus on the topic that uh, Don uh, was talking about near the end of his paper, that is how we should understand change in a monad. Um, it's well known that in the Aristotelian scholastic metaphysics, the nature of a substance determines its powers and organizes them around the production of ends. Every cause has a particular or specific end, a termination of action, which is its goal. Causes can thus be assessed for success, frustration, completeness, and imperfection. Equally well known, in the early modern mechanist universe, excluding minds, Nothing changes but the motion of material particles, and every change has a cause. But mechanists do not think of these causes as having ends or being subject to evaluation. No doubt there are several reasons for this, but it seems especially important that mechanist causal laws have very universal scope. They refer to a small number of causally relevant properties, determinants of extension, impenetrability, motion, and position just one set of properties explaining all change. For scholastics, the nature of fire includes powers internally structured toward uh, ends specific to fire, namely rising and causing fire. For mechanists, fire produces these same effects in virtue of the term determinate sizes, shapes, motions, and arrangement of the particles of which it's composed. Robert Boyle, the unofficial spokesman of mechanism, proposes that, quote, instead of nature in the sense of an aggregate of powers belonging to a body, especially a living body, we uh, may employ the constitution, the temperament, or the mechanism, uh, or sometimes the, the texture of the body. Yet the mere collision of particles seems insufficient to explain the complex organization exhibited by the bodies of living things. And many non-Cartesian mechanists appeal to something else in the created world to explain the generation and functional operation of plants and animals. I have in mind the plastic natures or the world soul, um, or as Boyle has it, the initial constitutions of moving particles which were uh, created at, at the first moment. Now to Leibniz's mind, there's a further and more pervasive stability which is explicable or inexplicable by matter and motion alone. Physical forces whose local effects are globally in tune so that, quote, the foundation of the laws of nature should be sought in the fact that it's necessary that the same quantity of active power be preserved, indeed, that the same quantity of motive action also be conserved. This cannot be explained by the essentially passive nature of matter and the laws of logic and mathematics, Leibniz says. He purports to explain the preter-material order of corporeal things on the basis of a multiplicity of immaterial substances called variously substantial forms, souls, or soul-like entelechies, primary forces, or monads. I'm going to call them monads out of convenience, but you should keep in mind that there are also these other terms that Leibniz gives to uh, these uh, 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 non-material uh, uh, sources of, uh, of force. Um, monads constitute our constituents of all living things. Each monad is first an incorporeal paradigm of the operations carried on in the body of a living thing. And second, it is a paradigm of the architectonic properties of the entire corporeal world. A monad is an enduring substance essentially acting, but only within itself, always achieving internal balance and overall regularity. 
Just as physical forces constantly produce change, yet sustain functional unity in bodies of living things and equilibrium in the corporeal world as a whole, monads are so many, quote, living mirrors of the universe, as Leibniz often says. But I think the metaphysical dependence actually runs the opposite way. The corporeal world reflects the operational diversity within an enduring unity, which is exemplified by every monad. I say all this to motivate my topic, change in the monad. It exemplifies what goes on in the world as a whole. Now, in a simple substance or a monad, there is nothing but perception and appetition, which would understand on the basis of what we are aware of within ourselves. The letter to de Volder. The idea is expressed in writings that predate and postdate this famous line to de Volder. Taking the doctrine at face value, monads in general engage in cognitive activity and have something akin to desires for the objects of cognition. Appetition is the principle of change in a monad, a tendency to go from perception to perception, from Principles of Nature and Grace, section two. One may be tempted to think change in a monad is explained in terms of some version of beliefs, desire, theoretical psychology, sufficiently general to apply to monads, whether or not they have conscious perceptions or even sense perceptions, as many, many monads do not, and many of our own perceptions are neither conscious nor sensory. Indeed, I want to suggest this is close to the truth. The terms perception and appetition are best understood in a literal but rather technical way. But some able scholars who are among us uh, raise objections to this, contending either that monadic perceptions have no legitimate claim to cognitive character, or that appetitions in general are not desire-like states directed to ends represented as good. Still, they maintain this does not undermine Leibniz's basic account of the unity that enables a, a monad to model the universe. According to Jonathan Bennett on this point, uh, Leibniz's fundamental theory says only that the monad runs through its history in accordance with the laws given to it by God, laws that govern the efficient causality of its unfolding. It's the existence of a law that unifies the monad. On the contrary, I want to suggest that a law sufficient to determine the successive states of a monad cannot be the source of its transtemporal uh, uh, unity. And um, understanding particular um, concrete perceptions and appetitions affords a neat account of the unity among all the acts of the monad. That appetites are directed to ends is not in dispute. The texts are explicit. Uh, I think this is number one on the handout. The laws of appetite are the laws of the final causes of good and evil. Moreover, the causal order internal to monads is contrasted with the order of corporeal events. Um, just on the handout again, souls act according to the laws of final causes through appetition, ends and means. Bodies act according to the laws of efficient causes or of motions. And the two realms, that of efficient causes and that of final causes, are in mutual harmony. It's clear that efficient causes act on preceding states in a way that generates subsequent states. Uh, quoting from Leibniz, whatever takes place in matter arises in accordance with laws of change from the preceding condition of matter. And this is what those who say that everything corporeal can be explained mechanically hold or ought to hold. It's equally clear that final causes explain change on the basis of its end or its goal. But there are at least two notions of final cause abroad in the 17th century. Number one, this is on the handout for reference, a final cause is a future event insofar as the agent has desire for it, which causes the agent to act if means are at hand. This sort of uh, final cause is, an efficient, uh, is efficient in its action, forward, forward moving, but unlike other efficient causes, contains a desire. Second, a final cause is a future state which the agent has the capacity to produce for the sake of which the agent presently performs such and such acts. This sort of final cause is not efficacious, 
nor does it essentially involve anything like desire on the part of the agent. And even if the agent does have a desire which is efficient cause of its acting, the desire may be for a result which is not its final cause in this sense. For example, if a person has appetite for water which is the efficient cause of her taking a sip, the final cause of her action might be, say, health, for which she might have no particular desire. The first sort of final cause has an end desired by the agent, whereas the second sort has an end, but not necessarily desired by the agent. Now, final causes of the second sort explain facts about change in bodies as well as in souls. Leibniz number five, it must be maintained in general that all existent facts can be explained in two ways, through a all existent facts, through a kingdom of power or efficient causes and through a kingdom of wisdom or final causes. There's a longer, more explicit quote to that effect on the handout. Light travels along the shortest path, not because it desires to do so, but because God, the creator, desires that it should do so. But in just the same way, Acts of monads have final causes. Whatever monads do tends to realize ends desired by God. How then are the laws of final cause which govern the realm of monads exclusively different from the laws of efficient causality which govern corporeal change? Because after all, appetites too are efficient causes or active tendencies. I think the answer is ready at hand. Monads are governed by efficacious desire-like final causes, while bodies are subsumed under efficient causal laws without reference to desires. And I think that the fact that attributing these two notions of final cause, the one to everything that happens in the monads, the other to everything that happens in bodies, uh, is a natural way of reading the two realms doctrine, and that we have at hand uh, a, na a natural way of, of explaining this difference, namely uh, the desiderative view of, of all appetites. Uh, however, <laughs> I say we will later consider why some commentators urge this cannot be correct. We've had a very uh, lucid presentation of that argument. But for the present, I want to argue that on the assumption that appetitions are essentially desire-like, a case can be made that perceptions are essentially cognitive. So I'm going to assume for the time being that uh, uh, app appetites are all uh, desire-like. Now, as you may know, Leibniz maintains that a monad or a simple substance perceives just in case its modifications express corporeal things outside of the monad. That is, each of its modifications has a complex structure in respect of which it is identical to the spatial, temporal, compositional, and causal dispositional structure of bodies and bodily events. So there's a structural identity between the uh, modifications of the monad on the, other, on the one hand and uh, the uh, bodies and bodily events on the other at the level of structure. Two main considerations put in question that the expressive modifications of monads, as I've just described them, generally qualify as even the lowest grade of cognitions. First, the mere fact that states of a monad carry information about the world is not enough to make it cognizant. Familiar illustrations of this point include thermocouples, adding machines, and high-powered computers. Despite having states that receive information and even making truth-preserving transformations on it, none of these things is cognitive, not by our lights. But second, Leibniz himself stresses that material things are capable of expressing other things. For example, maps express regions, complete effects express their causes, algebraic equations express geometrical figures, but none of them are cognizant according to Leibniz. Why should expression in an immaterial substance or a true unity, as Leibniz stresses, be so different? I'm aware of no texts which offer to defend or motivate this view. In fact, I will suggest that materials for motivating it might be found in pre-Cartesian scholastic Aristotelian theories of perception, which are not so familiar to us nowadays. But in a similar vein, walking around a mill is said to 